Please welcome Dr. Michael Ramsey. Wow, thank you, DA. That was a wake up call. Thank you. I think that's going to leave us with a lot of thought. Thank you. Um, the biggest payer of, of medicine in this country is um, uh, government funded health care. And we've had uh, Ruth Ann Durrell from OIG on a panel yesterday. We had Michelle Schreiber from uh, CMS uh, yesterday. And today we've got Amy Ashcroft, Deputy Regional Inspector General of, for the Office of Evaluation and Inspections, HHS Office of Inspector General of the OIG. And she's going to talk to us too about latest updates uh, uh, from the oversight uh, of and payment of medicine. So, Amy, thank you so much indeed for joining us. Please welcome Amy Ashcraft. All right, well, thank you, DA. Um, that was an exciting presentation and challenged us to raise the bar and question our status norms. And I think that's a good segue into what I'm gonna to talk about today, which is our um, the status of healthcare in America, the status of patient safety. And if we can put my slides up, that would be great. Um, so my name is Amy Ashcraft, and I work for the Office of Inspector General at the OIG for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And we're an office that has a long history of doing work in patient safety, and we're excited to share some of what we've learned today. Several of my OIG colleagues are here, as Dr. Ramsey mentioned, Ruth Ann Dorrell. Um, we also have Dimitri Martinez, Quinn Tran, over in the middle of the room about, Katie Foster, Shania Thomas, Kristen Khalil, and we have one of our invaluable physician consultants as well, and that's Dr. David Stockwell. So the primary work of the OIG is healthcare fraud, particularly Medicare fraud. But the work I plan to discuss today stems from the independent research we conduct to make programs within the Department of Health and Human Services function more efficiently and effectively and to protect the patients that are served by those programs. So we oversee 11 operating divisions within HHS, and many of these play a significant role in patient safety. You've heard from some of our partners yesterday, um, CMS and ARC, about their patient safety efforts. And other examples include FDA's role in regulating the safety of drugs and devices, and CDC's efforts to reduce hospital-acquired infections or healthcare-acquired infections and adverse drug events. And a few of the HHS programs also provide direct patient care, such as Indian Health Services and the Healthcare Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. So you can see that patient safety is a significant part of HHS. So in our role to oversee these programs, we have to ask ourselves, how safe are patients? How safe is the care we would provide in our hospitals, nursing homes, and other post-acute care settings? And how many federal dollars are being spent as a result of that patient harm? So you've heard about a couple of our reports yesterday, but over the past 15 years or so, we've published more than 20 reports on adverse events and patient safety. Seven of these were medical record reviews designed to establish a national rate of harm. What is the actual incidence of harm in America? Now, before I share those findings, I'd like to clarify what we in OIG mean by patient harm. We view harm from the perspective of the patient and include all causes of harm. Our definition is encompassing any undesirable outcome caused by the medical care that a patient receives that isn't caused by the underlying disease. This can include things that some hospitals don't take into account, like prolonged side effects or complications. Now, we have extensive guidelines about what constitutes harm for particular circumstances, but in general, we look for three things. We look for a clinical cause, and that helps us distinguish adverse events from underlying disease. We look for signs and symptoms in the patient and a medical intervention that's necessary to treat the harm. So next, this slide shows the results of our seven adverse event medical record reviews um, in various settings and displays the years. And you can see that, um, that we had a rate in 2010 that was pretty alarming. 27% of Medicare patients experienced harm by the care that they received. That's one in four patients. 
And as we continued conducting medical record reviews in other settings, we found a pretty consistent message. Patient harm is common. 33% of nursing home patients experienced adverse events, almost half of long-term care patients. But as we were conducting these reports, the world was changing. Medical providers are paying more attention to adverse events. Value-based purchasing programs expanded and patient safety organizations were taking root. So with this attention, we wondered, how much progress have we made? How much safer are patients now than they were when we began this work in 2008 and 2010? So I'll direct your attention to the two squares in green. Um, these studies were designed to provide a comparison to answer that question. The 2010 study was based on a nationally representative sample of Medicare patients who were discharged from hospitals in the year 2008. And our new report released in 2022 took a similar sample of patients who were discharged from hospitals 10 years later in 2018. We hope to find, and we expected to find, significant improvement in the rate of harm, but we didn't. There were some reductions in specific types of adverse events that had received focused attention, such as C. diff infections and catheter-associated UTIs, but the broader national incidence rate of all-cause harm barely budged. The difference, that 27% to 25%, was not statistically significant. And the patient harm events we found had real tangible impacts both to patient outcomes and to the cost of providing care. For the 2022 report, we estimated the additional costs to Medicare to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars every month. Now we can't directly compare these two reports. Things had changed, definitions for some types of events had evolved and Medicare patients had gotten sicker. More chronic diseases means that patients may be exposed to riskier treatments which can be associated with higher rates of harm. Still, this lack of improvement raised some serious questions. What's driving these numbers? Why didn't we see improvement? And what else can we do? Now, we don't have full answers to those questions, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do know. So first, let's talk about the numbers. The harm events we found in 2022 did not look significantly different than the events we found in 2020, in 2010, I'm sorry. So let's look at, first at severity. To measure the severity of harm, we used an index that some of you might be familiar with, and that's the NCC MERP scale, which is the National Coordinating Council's Medication Error Reporting and Prevention Index. And we used a modified version to rank impact of harm to the patient. Temporary harm events are events that required clinical intervention, but did not cause lasting harm. And while these can be severe, adverse events are the ones that prolong the patient's stay or have an even more significant impact on the patient. And we found a fairly even split between these two groups, almost identical to what we found 10 years before. Next is preventability. Our expert physician reviewers found that in 2022, 43% of events were preventable. In 2010, we found a rate of 44%, no change. This is the group we had the most hope of changing. If the ratio between preventable and non-preventable events had changed, if we were getting closer to that goal of zero preventable harm, then we might conclude that this was because of population differences, but that isn't what we were observed. And next, we also looked at the types of harm and found that medication events were by far the most common and infections were the least common. Again, that's similar to what we found 10 years before. So the takeaway is that we didn't see any noticeable differences. It didn't appear that the events that underlie our 25% rate of harm had changed very much. So we also explored the reasons that events occurred. And if our goal is zero preventable harm, let's look at the group that's specifically was preventable, that 43%. We observed substandard care. We observed a failure to take necessary precautions, errors, inadequate plans, inadequate monitoring. So a significant portion of these events could have been prevented through better care. 
So the next big question is if many of these events were preventable and the medical community has had a focus on reducing events, why didn't we see improvement? So let's consider how improvement happens. How do our patient safety efforts lead to changes that protect patients? The first step is knowing what kinds of harm you need to prevent. And we've discussed the importance of boards at length over the past two days, and there's no doubt that culture of patient safety and having boards make a priority out of patient safety is a critical foundation. But it's also about the steps that hospitals take when harms do occur. Do adverse events feed into the hospital's knowledge base for making system improvements? Step one is capturing events in hospital systems. But in reality, many providers don't really try to capture all kinds of harm. We often hear them say, we don't track known complications or side effects. We don't track low level harm. We don't track events that are not preventable. So my question is, what are we missing when we impose these criteria before capturing events within the hospital systems? How will you know if providers have excessively high complication rates if you aren't measuring them? And temporary harm events theoretically have less impact to the patient, but shouldn't we still be trying to reduce them? And how does one know an event is not preventable before you even capture it in your system? Hospitals are making some heroic efforts. They are working to reduce harm, but we aren't making, a, we aren't making substantial progress as a nation, and that's disturbing. To identify where more work is needed, we need to capture all kinds of harm in our incident reporting and surveillance systems and work to understand their causes. So I urge you to ask yourself, what kinds of harm do you track? And what do you investigate? Many providers focus on events that have a requirement to be reported or lead to a payment penalty, like Sentinel events or Medicare's list of hospital-acquired conditions. When the focus is on these narrow lists, providers are likely to miss events that have real health consequences to patients. And we aren't all speaking the same language. There are an extraordinary number of terms that we used to talk about harm. One study I read found 60 different terms used to describe patient safety related just to medication. And we don't all define terms the same way. Maybe one of the reasons we miss events is because we don't all agree on what should be captured. And then you have questions like, do patient harm events include near misses? Should a non-preventable complication really be considered harm? Not everyone agrees on those answers. And that lack of agreement affects how we collect our data. The net result is that we don't always know about the harm that's occurring in our facilities. And when comparing metrics to benchmarks or even to our own past performance, we may not be making a fair comparison. Following our 2010 report that found that 25% of patients experienced harm, we did a follow-up study where we asked hospitals whether they had captured specific events within their incident reporting and surveillance systems we found that they knew about very few of those events, just 14%. And we're currently working on a report to update this number, and it'll be released soon. Using the events in our 2022 report, we're going back to those hospitals and asking whether they captured events within their system, those specific events that we found. And this report will provide insights on why hospitals missed events or chose not to capture them. And when they did know about events, what did they do? Did they conduct an investigation? Did they disclose them to patients? Did they report them to any external groups like CMS, patient safety organizations, or states? And most importantly, did they make a system improvement to help prevent similar types of events from happening in the future? So this brings us to our last question. What else can we do? In particular, what can hospitals do? Now, we've already talked a lot about things that hospitals can do in this conference, uh, so these things are not new. But let's ensure that everyone in the hospital system is using the same definitions of harm and understands the breadth of events that should be captured within their incident reporting systems. I encourage everyone to consider tracking all cause harm and to expand the sources of information you use to measure it. Second, Let's expand our efforts regarding transparency. Talk about patient safety regularly and in all levels of the organization, 
Use ARC's candor guidance or another CRP to disclose events to patients and use voluntary reporting options to maximize our learning about adverse events. Let's also ensure that patient safety is a priority for everyone from the custodian to the governing board. Integrate it into every job. You might be interested in our toolkits. The first one is a summary of our methodological approach identifying and categorizing patient harm. And the second is the clinical guidance that we use to decide whether individual events counted as harm as we were conducting reviews. It's more complex than it seems sometimes. We wanted to provide the insights that we've learned so that others could build upon them. And these resources are free and available on the OIG website. In addition to the boots on the ground work that's being done in hospitals, HHS has many ongoing efforts to improve safety. We heard from ARC yesterday about the National Action Alliance and its goal of zero preventable harm. We heard from CMS about its revisions to the conditions of participation and the new patient safety structural measure, and that's just to name a few. And we in OIG make recommendations to how, on how to improve patient safety, and we're continuing to look for ways to improve patient safety across HHS programs. So if you'd like to learn more about our work, you can find all of our reports on our website, uh, along with our published work plan, and a list of outstanding recommendations to HHS partners. We also have a featured topics page that includes a page specifically dedicated to our adverse events work. So thank you everyone and for your time and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any thoughts about how we can improve patient safety in HHS. Uh, my email is here. Um, I don't, don't hesitate to use it and I would also be happy to let you know whenever our new report on hospital identification identification of harm and incident reporting systems is released. Thanks.